Welcome to another episode of Pinsky Law Presents. And on this day, we are going to present to you seven modules on fire department billing for ambulance services. So we've broken this down into seven modules so you can watch it at your leisure. It will be readily available. You'll be able to download this as well. This series is based on our research and our experience, which is extensive with ambulance billing. And before we get too far into it, if you have any questions you would like us to answer, especially if you're willing to have us answer them online as part of a question and answer series that we'll add as an eighth module, please send them to our website or email address and you will see the address on these slides. So without further ado, let's get into a fire department billing for ambulance services. This is part one, again, of seven modules, and this is the introduction portion. Now, I note that each module is somewhere between seven to 15 slides and should take about 30 minutes to get through. So first, let's talk about who does not need to worry about all of this rigmarole on fire department ambulance billing, because we're getting a lot of calls from uh, a lot of villages and towns saying, okay, can we start billing? And I'm like, well, you've already been able to bill for many, many decades. So villages, cities, towns do not have to worry about this. Uh, the village city uh, can have a ambulance department within its uh, village or city. The town uh, subsequently can contract and all of this is under general municipal law 122B. You do not need to worry about General Municipal Law 209B, which is where the fire department ambulance billing laws are now situated. Um, now, just to note, and we're going to talk more about this, you may not want to use the fire department billing setup that was just approved by the governor. You may not want to use that if you have another option. There are a lot of restrictions with ambulance billing for fire departments that do not exist under general miss law 122 b so if you can avoid it especially if you're a village city or a town then you are going to want to try to avoid it because for example as you'll see in these sessions mutual aid billings prohibited under 209 b and you would lose a lot of income so again if you're a village city or town there's a better way to work with the fire department for ambulance billing um, than just this. So I want to note a huge change that occurred before we go too far. And this is really interesting. So previously, counties, villages, cities, and towns could not contract with the fire department's rescue squad for ambulance services. Um, General Municipal Law 122B had a specific prohibition that uh, did not allow the city, town, or village, or county to contract with a rescue squad of a fire department. In this legislation, the prohibition was removed. Now, as you'll see, a fire department can only bill for services in its primary operating territory. So if you can avoid having to use the General Municipal Law 209B ambulance setup, and you can use the 122B route, we would prefer to do that. So let me just note that a county, village, city, town, and a fire district can obtain a municipal um, ambulance service certificate, ambulance service certificate, right, in the name of the municipality, um, and then they can contract for the ambulance services potentially with a fire department outside of the um, restrictions in 209B. The language is a little confusing, and we're not 100% sure what the town village city has at its disposal when it wants to contract with a rescue squad because there's language in that um, part of the statute in 122b that allows the town village city county to contract with the rescue squad there's a language that's a little confusing and the language is confusing because it's not clear whether it says but all of the restrictions in 209b would still be in place or whether it's just referring to, hey, this is a rescue squad as defined in 209B. 
We'll have to look at that a little more. If that is something you want to do and you should want to do if you're a town, village, or city to get around all of this and you want to contract with a rescue squad of another fire department, that would be worth looking into. But again, let me make clear, if you're a village and you have a fire department, you own your own fire department, we would simply create an ambulance department, which the fire department then could utilize and always has been able to utilize. You do not need to go this route. I just wanted to take the moment before you listen to seven modules and say there's a much better way to go if you're a village, city, or town. Whether or not you want to contract with a rescue squad of a fire department, uh, there's a better way to go. In any event, the municipality can bill under its own ambulance service certificate, or if you're a village and you have your own fire department, uh, or a city and you have your own fire department, or you're a county and uh, you want to contract in certain different ways, you could probably avoid a lot of this 209B uh, restrictive language. So now let's talk about 209B. So billing is now authorized. The prohibition that used to be in 209B paragraph 4 has been removed. And for the most part, it's good. As you're going to see in another module, there are a lot of problems with this language that we're going to want to address. Um, and there are some ways around it that I can get around some of the problems. The rest, we just got to ask the legislature to make changes and improve the statute. So please watch the section where we talk about all the problems with the language because we're going to want to aggressively get these um, get these problems with the, with the legislation, we're going to want to get them solved. Uh, so this can be better and perfect for everybody. So although this is a huge victory for the fire district and some fire departments, there are several issues that this legislation creates. Okay, so we're past July 8th now, but if you are a uh, fire department and you're ready to bill, then uh, you can start billing as of July 8th. So you first ask, well, is billing worth the trouble? Well, let's talk about that. If you bill, you're going to be required to bill electronically, right? Which means you need an electronic PCR. Now, a lot of the counties in New York State have already gone to an electronic PCR program. Some of the REMSCOs have purchased them. So you may not be paying for this. Uh, but you also may not be using an electronic PCR now. And you maybe think, oh, this is going to be a big expense. Let me provide a little comfort there. Many of the bi bigger billing companies will provide the electronic PCR charting software for free. And various ones work with, you know, various billing companies work with various uh, electronic PCR companies. So you'll want to see who they can um, provide. And many of the billing companies now are even providing the computer and the tablets. So they'll um, provide them, maintain them, install them, etc. So there's another big benefit. They're really trying to get your business. So I would say that billing is worth the trouble, even if you if, if you have. I would say that billing's worth the trouble, even if you have to uh, switch over to electronic PCRs. Now, how much can billing generate? Well, obviously, this depends on your payer mix. So if you're in a rich or poor area or rural area, um, it it matters. So there's a lot of um, so how much can billing generate? Well, billing can generate an average of $325 for a basic life support service call and an average of $425 for an ALS call. Plus, you also get mileage for a loaded mile, which is the patient is in the ambulance and being transported to the hospital. Now, again, this depends on the payer mix of your city, town, village service area, right? Some may have a lot of Medicaid. Some may have a lot of Medicare. If you have nursing homes, uh, it depends how far you are from the hospital, the closest appropriate hospital. We'll talk about that in another module. So it all depends. But on average, what we have found, and I think most billing companies have found, that 325 and 425 will be your average collected rates. And this includes bad debt, people who do not pay. Um, so look, billing also costs money though. So it's not hundred percent gravy. It's about 10% or maybe $32 per claim sur submitted. We're going to urge that you go to a flat fee billing arrangement, but either way, it, it's about nine to 10% and about 28 to $32 per claim submitted. 
So is it worth it? Listen, if you're over 100 calls per year, it is definitely worth billing. If you are less than 100 calls per year, it may not be worth billing. But if you are a rural BLS ambulance service or fire department with an ambulance, you're going to be forced to bill. We'll talk about that a little later. But if you're rural and we'll help you decide if you are rural, if you don't know, you better stay tuned. So let's talk about this. Can a non-transport EMS agency bill? So a fire department that just provides rescue services, can they bill? Most people have said no. And in fact, originally I thought no, but then let's look at the language. The law states that emergency and general ambulance services, including emergency medical service, as defined in section 3001 of the public health law, can bill for services. So, okay, we know what an emergency and general ambulance service is. That's the fire department, clearly. But what is, an, what is the emergency medical service that's in addition to the ambulance? Well, this is defined in the public health law. And what that is, it's an initial medical assistance. Think of that, initial emergency medical assistance. That is exactly the fire department running a non-transporting first response service. So this seems to be that it's separate from an ambulance service. If this is what was intended, great. If it's not what was intended, I don't know what was intended. So I think, in fact, under this definition, both ambulance services and first response non-ambulance services in the fire department can bill. However, is it worth it? Probably not. It probably isn't. Um, look, no fault might pay, but it probably isn't worth uh, billing for first response services. But this is something you should discuss with the billing company based on the types of calls and the number of calls. If you do a lot of highway and motor vehicle accident calls, you may find it worth it. So once you have decided to bill, I want to get you moving, you've got to start applying for the federal billing numbers. Uh, you can apply online to the national provider identifier This is for an MPI, um, and then you get the PICOS number. We can assist you with that if you haven't selected a billing company, but if you have, most of your billing companies routinely provide these services. It's not complicated. It takes them 10, 15 minutes, um, but it does take some time. You'll get the NPI pretty quickly in a week or so, but the PICOS and then Medicare numbers, that could take uh, many, many weeks, uh, months even. So you're going to want to get started now, even while we're doing everything else it takes to get you billing. So one of the first things we have to do is we have to look at the ambulance service certificate. Federal and state regulations limit the authority to bill for ambulance services to the entity that actually is authorized to provide the ambulance service, right? So think about that. Who owns the ambulance service certificate? Under federal law, that's who is doing the billing. So who holds it? Well, Again, whoever holds it is the only entity authorized to bill for those services. So whoever owns the certificate applies for the billing numbers, plural, and then will set up a bank account to receive the funds and those funds come into that account. What happens after the funds come into the account, the account, that's a different issue. That may be provided for in a contract and we'll talk about that contract because one is required by law. So we need to look at whether the ambulance service certificate is in the name of the entity you want to have it in the name of. So this is something that's upsetting me. I am hearing that there are many attorneys for fire districts and look, we're an attorney for fire, many, many, many fire districts. But some of these attorneys seem to be giving misleading information to their clients or maybe to the fire departments by telling them that the fire district in a fire district must own the ambulance service certificate. This is not true. The law is very clear, exceptionally clear, unequivocally clear that a fire department in a fire district who holds the ambulance service certificate simply must have a contract with the fire district. Nothing says that only the fire district can bill. Nothing says that the fire department has to transfer the ambulance service certificate to the fire district. Do not believe anyone who says that. That's not the case. There might be a lot of benefits to doing that. And when we start talking about 
co-payments and out-of-pockets, that's going to be a very important discussion that will come up in a separate module. And we urge you to watch it if you're going to be um, waiving, so to speak, the co-payments or you're going to, you, you want to bill insurance only. So under the law, the fire district or whoever the authority and control of the fire department, village, city, um, you know, the town, uh, they set the rates. But that doesn't mean that they have to hold the ambulance service certificate. That can stay in the name of the fire department. And that's a conversation you want to have with the attorney who understands this on whether it's beneficial or not to transfer it. And that's going to be based on a number of factors, whether we can move to the general municipal law 122B method of billing, such as if the fire department uh, if the actual fire department corporation, membership corporation holds a certificate, maybe you want to transfer it to the village. If you want to waive co-payments or bill insurance only, maybe we want to transfer the certificate to the government entity. But these are complicated but important discussions we have to have early in the process. So let's read the certificate. First of all, whose name is it in? Now that's complicated. You got to look at the name. Does it end in ink, right? If it says comma ink, well, that's probably the fire department membership corporation. The question is, is that entity really incorporated? To figure that out, we got to go to the Department of State website and look to see that's actually a real entity, or at least it existed when the ambulance service certificate was given out, uh, which probably was in the mid seventies. That's when these certificates came about. Does it say squad? Look, a squad has a number of meanings. Uh, under General Municipal Law 209B, the squad may actually be the fire department or the fire district. If it doesn't end with ink, it may not be the membership entity. So if the fire company owns the ambulance service certificate, we really need to review the certificate of incorporation to ensure that billing is not prohibited. Why? Because in some certificates, and we don't see this a lot, it's rare, but we still have to look. You have to make sure that it doesn't have language, something like all services shall be provided without charge. I've seen that more in ambulance uh, companies, certificates of incorporation, not as much in fire departments, but I have seen it. So we got to check. I'm just giving you the heads up. So who fixes the fees? Well, that part's certainly clear. The authorities who have control of the fire department or the fire company, who have authorized the fire department or fire company to provide the ambulance services, that entity fixes the schedule of fees or charges, which is then paid by the insured patient. Uh, and you'll see later why I say insured patient, not just any patient. So who controls the fire department? Well, if you're located in a fire protection district, right? That's not a fire district. A fire protection district has no commissioners and that's where you're contracting directly with the town. Then the town controls and then the town sets the rates and the town gives approval to bill. If you're in a fire district, right? With commissioners, then the fire district gives the fire department or company the permission to bill and fixes the fees. Again, they don't have to own the ambulance service certificate. And in a village, uh, the villages control the fire department. But again, if you're in a village, I'm really encouraging the village to go the 122B route and not go down this path. You're going to find it's much better. So make sure the ambulance service certificate is in the name of the entity that you want to bill under. This has got to match the federal provider number, right? That, that's clear. Otherwise, you're going to get into some federal troubles. And if you're in a fire district, the certificate does not have the word ink or incorporated at the end, uh, it might belong to the district. We have to look. So does the certificate use the term department? Well, the department may be the district. If you're in a fire district, it may not be the corporation. That word ink matters, and it certainly matters if the fire department is incorporated or not. So owning fees versus fixing fees. Well, this is going to be discussed in a later series uh, in this series of seven or eight modules. But all billing has got to be, again, performed under the name of the entity that owns the ambulance service certificate. The municipality fixes the rate, and then the funds are dispersed in accordance with the contract. That's what we want to make clear. Owning fees is different than fixing fees. The authority and control fixes the fees. Who owns them? Initially, it's the fire department ambulance or whoever the certificate is in the name of. And then what happens to the fees after is subject to whatever is in the negotiated contract. So 
A question came up, and this is extremely confusing, and I think bad drafting, but I want to explain it because I'm getting a lot of questions on it. Can entities like fire departments or ambulance services of fire departments who were created after January 1st of 22, can they bill for services? Let me show you the language. It's here why this is confusing or confusing to attorneys. And this is really bad language. So it says an emergency and general ambulance service, and I've omitted some words for simplicity, may apply such fees and charges only within such services, primary response territory. Now stop there. That is going to be the anti-mutual aid prohibition, which for some reason people are not realizing is here, but we'll get to that in another slide, but let's keep going. So charges can only be applied within the service's primary response territory as evidenced by a valid ambulance service certificate, some of you call it the CON, issued by the Commissioner of Health pursuant to 3005 of the Public Health Law on or before January 1st, 2022. Now, the way some attorneys are reading this, which I think is very much incorrect, is to say that, wait a minute, your certificate had to be issued prior to 1122. And if you got the ability to, um, to provide ambulance services after this, then that uh, prohibits you from billing. And that would be for municipal CONs. If you had a CON transferred to you after that date, that would be their argument. However, I fully disagree. It does not mean that you cannot bill if your ambulance service certificate was issued after 1122. I do not agree. What it does mean is that the proof of your area is reflected in the certificate after 1122. In other words, if you held one area in 1980 and then it changed in 1990 and then in 2001 it changed again, it doesn't matter. The only area you can bill in is what was reflected in 1122. And I would also argue if you change that later on, I think that also you can bill. If you expand or you shrink, that's your territory. And let's think about some other common sense just to deal with the attorneys who are saying this. All renewals are issued biannually. And if you look at the ambulance certificate, it uses the same language as in the statute. It said issued. Well, every two years, the certificate is reissued. If the language was read to mean that if your ambulance certificate has an issuance date after 1122, you can't bill. Well, then people at most, fire departments at most, are only going to be able to bill for two years because it's reissued biannually. So I don't really think this meant anything like people are arguing. Now, this also, if you read it that way, would prohibit municipal CON holders from billing because they don't bill under or they didn't get uh, their authority to have uh, ambulance service under that section. They were under a different section, the municipal CON section, and they uh, were not given the ambulance service certificate under the law referred to. And so anyone, any municipality with a muni CON would never be able to bill. That's another reason why I know that this did not mean that no one can bill if the issue date on your ambulance certificate is after 1122. I would not worry about that. Now, we will worry about the mutual aid prohibition in there, and we will talk extensively about that. So let's keep going. Billing service contracts and bidding. Look, bidding um, is not required. Billing services are professional services and are not subject to billing. I do have a concern though. A concern I have is if they are providing computer equipment, that very well may make the contract subject to bidding because they're providing you computer equipment. If the computer equipment is valued at $35,000 or more, and you are a fire district, which is going to arrange for the billing service contract, then I suggest if computers are provided, you've got to bid it out. I don't like it, but I think that's honestly the true answer. So if, again, if you're a fire district, or a village and you're subject to bidding, or a city and you're subject to bidding, 
If you're going to go the 209B route, again, if you're a villager city, I think there are better ways, the 122B route, but if you're going to go that way and computer equipment valued at $35,000 or more is provided, I think you have to bid it out. If you're simply doing the billing service portion of it, that's a professional service. If there's no hardware included, that is not to be bid out. Um, so you're going to have to find out what the value of the uh, computer equipment is. So let me just talk about billing service agreements. I've been negotiating these for more than two decades, and there's a lot of issues in them that your attorney needs to know about. Of course, we're always, as we'll say later, we're always happy to work with your attorney. If they're not expert in this, we can certainly help them along the way, and we'll serve as special counsel to uh, work with both your present attorney and all of you to uh, get down the right path. Okay, so... Issues in your bidding, if you bid it out or just looking for RFPs, I think you're going to want a flat fee uh, for all billings, not a percentage. Uh, percentage billings, as we're going to talk about in a later module, they increase the risk of fraud. Why? Because the more the insurance company makes, i.e. on a percentage, the more they have the incentive to increase the bill. And upcharging or upcoding, as it's called, may um, result in a higher bill. And so that gives them the incentive to upcharge or upcode. So what you want to do is tell them, look, you're getting paid a flat fee of 30, $32, whatever it is. And then you want to, uh, still audit them, which we're definitely going to talk about later, but then you don't have to worry as much that they're upcoding because there's no advantage to them. That said, many billing companies will not do that. And look, there is some benefit to the percentage-based bill, right? The more they can earn, the more they'll do work for you. The more they want to do work for you because they earn more. Um, I think that's true. But if that's the way you go, then we're going to have to audit either way. But definitely that way, we're going to have to audit the billing company. And we're going to talk about audits later. But if you do not audit your billing company, you are risking federal felonies. And we're going to talk a lot about that. So keep that in the back of your mind or in the front of your mind. So if you can get them to do a flat fee bill, all the better. And just to note, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, government uh, insurers mandate flat fee billing because they understand that it's in fact wrought with fraud if you go the percentage-based billing. Okay, we're going to want to talk about how tax monies are applied to co-payments in these agreements. Uh, the billing company has to participate. There is work for the billing company on how they deal with co-payments, whether they uh, bill them, whether they put a statement at the end that says, hey, the municipality has waived them for you. If it's a municipal fire department, um, there's a lot of things that the billing company needs to participate in. We have to talk about internal billing audits. Um, this is going to involve some work on the billing company to transfer out random bills so that the auditor can see uh, the bills. And, and not to get too much on the audit, we're going to talk about that later, but I'm not talking about like a CPA audit. These are audits that we've been doing for probably two decades or more, uh, extensively in the past five years with many ambulance companies. These are billing audits, very different than a CPA audit. So that's not what I mean. Um, we need to talk about in the bidding and the RFP and the contract, either or, um, to talk about electronic PCR programs, providing that for free, uh, reporting requirements, what reports can they run? Not all programs are created equal. So you better decide what reports you want and put that in the contract. And post-termination obligations. So they have to turn over uncollected accounts. What data do you get? What billing information do you get? What will they do if they receive funds? There's a lot to talk about in these agreements. This is not, do not just have your attorney review what comes in and not add uh, items. Remember, and, I, and there are some great billing companies out there. I, I have no issue with most of them, but some of them will give you contracts. Look, everybody's going to give you a contract that benefits them, not you. You need to know these issues and some others that affect and benefit and protect you and the taxpayers. So billing steps. We want to confirm that the ambulance certificate is in the correct name. We want to apply for a federal billing number and PCOS number so we can start billing and get that process moving. Again, your billing company, if you've selected one, can assist. We want to review your certificate of incorporation for prohibitions on billing and charging if the fire company is billing. 
We want to hire and bid or put it on an RFP for a billing company, which we'll talk about. Um, we want to review and amend fire protection contracts. That topic's going to come up. We want to develop policies on billing. That topic's coming up. We want to talk about HIPAA compliance programs. You've got to implement a HIPAA compliance program. We will talk about that. And we want to adopt and implement a billing compliance program and audits. We will talk about that. So as we finish up part one, you're probably saying, oh my God, look at all these things that, you know, we need to do. Well, yeah, there is a ton of things to do because you're playing with billing fire. If you are just saying to the billing company, yeah, go ahead and do it. You are risking being charged with federal and state crime. So we want to make sure that you do everything properly, not to violate any of the many laws and regulations that govern billing, not just at the state level, but at the federal level. So we've set up a flat fee of 6,500. We're doing it for a ton of uh, departments and already, and it's working out really well. We give you basically unlimited advice to negotiate uh, your way through this process. We'll review the ambulance service certificates. We'll correct the ambulance certificate if we can do so just by changing a name. We'll review uh, the certificate of incorporation for issues. We'll provide bid specifications for the billing companies. We'll edit the municipal and or fire company agreements. We'll review, edit, and negotiate billing agreements with the billing services. We'll draft and negotiate the ALS intercept agreements. That is a big, big project, uh, and we'll talk more about that. We will provide billing compliance programs, and we will provide you training and recorded video that you can use uh, forever. And we will provide training and report writing. We will also, to go back to HIPAA, we'll provide that training and a recording you can use forever um, to train your people. So we offer a lot for the 6,500, and we just tell you about it now because we don't want you to panic saying, where am I ever going to do this? And is it going to cost a lot? And is it going to cost more than the billing we generate? We've tried to make it easy for you. We can also do the monthly audit services of billing. That's very important. We're going to talk a lot about that in an upcoming module. General legal advice on billing. Most of that will be provided in the 6500. We can assist with hiring staff, drafting an HR manual, if that's what you do with your money that you now have. We can work with incentive programs to increase volunteering because you're going to need it because this is a lot of work on your volunteers or your employees. We can talk about statutory spending limitation, and that's going to come up soon because none of the income and none of the expenses are exempt from the statutory spending limit. So we can assist with evaluating it and making changes to, um, to increase it if we need to. We can create billing rules for you. We can transfer the ambulance service certificate. If, uh, it's, not, if it's more than just changing a name, we got to go to the REMSCO and get approval. So there is a lot we can do. So as we finish this part one of the introduction to fire department ambulance billing, if you have any questions so far, send them to us and we're going to do a series, a module, an eighth module just on your questions so we make sure to address it. So until next time, this is Brad Pinsky for Pinsky Law Presents.